Okay, well, it's day three here at ESC 2024 in London, but we still have a lot of hotlines that keep coming. I think today some important data came from the heart failure uh, area. Khaled, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the first trial that came out? Well, yeah, this morning the hotline session uh, addressed the uh, entity of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction. The finra known in heart failure with mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction, fine arts heart failure claim was presented. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial testing the hypothesis that finerenone, a neuralocorticoid receptor antagonist, would reduce cardiovascular death and total worsening heart failure events in patients with heart failure only mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction. The inclusion criteria were symptomatic patients with heart failure in HYA class 2 to 4 with an EF greater than 40% either ambulatory or hospitalized recently for heart failure with an elevated natriuretic peptide, uh, evidence of structural heart disease usually in the form of either LVH or left atrial enlargement, uh, and had required diuretics in the 30 days prior to randomization. Obviously, if these patients were on an MRA in the prior 30 days, this was an exclusion criteria, as were specific cardiomyopathies such as peripartum cardiomyopathy, chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, infiltrative cardiomyopathy such as amyloidosis. Patients with a potassium greater than five again were uh, excluded. And obviously if patients had alternate sim uh, explanations for their symptoms of dyspnea, they were also excluded. The primary endpoint was a, a, a composite of cardiovascular death and total heart failure events were either hospitalizations or visits to, to emergency room for treatment. Secondary endpoints uh, included the uh, the, compo the uh, components of the composite, total heart failure events, NHYA class at 12 months, quality of life at 6, 9, and 12 months compared to baseline, and a regional composite endpoint as well as all-cause mortality. Just over 6,000 patients were randomized uh, uh, to either finrenone, uh, based on, uh, dosing was based on EGFR versus placebo. Uh, the, the results of the study showed that uh, patients treated with Finrenone had a reduced cardiovascular death and total worsening heart failure events, that is the primary endpoint was reduced significantly compared to placebo. Uh, and this benefit was accompanied by improvements in health status as evidenced by an improvement in quality of life scores. Uh, and this these results were consistent uh, across all pre-specified uh, subgroups, in including those for EFs from 40 all the way to 60%. Furthermore, this benefit was also seen in patients who are already taking baseline uh, GL2 inhibitors. Uh, hyperkalemia, though, was noted more commonly in the, in the mineral agonist receptor uh, active treatment group, although serious hyperkalemia was quite rare, less than 3%. Uh, and uh, this data, I think, will be used to support the use of this agent uh, to the armamentarium of treatment of patients with uh, heart failure and a preserved or only mildly reduced ejection fraction. So along those lines, a, another meta-analysis was presented today that really had pre-specified individual patient level uh, uh, evaluation of the um, major trials that actually involved patients who had reduced ejection fraction, um, moderately reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. So really the whole spectrum. Over 13,800 patients were involved. It included rails, emphasis, heart failure top cat, and of course the fine arts uh, HF trial that was presented. The safety of MRAs was consistent across all the trials where we saw that serious hyperkalemia was actually low in the range of 3% and the risk of hypokalemia, which is also uh, an important adverse event, was 50% lower in the MRA group. So really, in these 14,000 patients, we have confirmation now that MRAs in heart failure, all subsets, there is a benefit um, and in all subgroups and the, and the safety profile is extremely high. Um, and along those lines, again, I want to move from heart failure, but to a different entity of the um, cardiovascular space, which is elderly patients. Um, we finally have some evidence that's being uh, reported this, uh, today. The first one is the senior Rita by uh, Professor Vijay, um, and she 
her, she and the remainder of the trialists actually enrolled patients who had a non-ST elevation MI and were over the age of 75 years. Now they randomized these patients to an invasive strategy and a conservative strategy and the median follow-up was about 4.1 years. The primary endpoint was cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction and the secondary endpoints were the two components of the primary endpoint as well as unscheduled or unplanned revascularization, all-cause death, stroke, hospitalization for heart failure and bleeding complications as well as some quality of life metrics. They actually ended up enrolling over 1,500 patients of whom 45% were women. 72% were over the age of 80, so this is indeed an elderly uh, population. And 80% had either frailty or pre-frailty. So these were not sturdy um, elderly patients that were enrolled. There was no difference in the primary endpoint, which occurred in about 25.6% of the invasive arm and 26.3% of the conservative group. And again, consistent across all groups, uh, including frailty. And as far as the secondary endpoints, there was no difference in cardiovascular death, which occurred at 15.8 in the invasive and 14.2 in the conservative arm. But there was a significant reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarctions, 11.7% in the invasive arm and 15% in the conservative arm. And unplanned revascularization was um, lower in the invasive arm, occurring at 3.9% compared with 13.7% in the conservative arm. But no differences in the other secondary endpoints. The procedural complications in the overall population was actually reassuringly low at 1%. So the results of this trial really are encouraging. So for older patients who suffer a non-ST elevation MI, again, this was not ST elevation myocardial infarction, but it allows an informed decision by the clinician and the patient on whether to undergo an invasive strategy or not. Knowing that an invasive strategy is in fact safe and may significantly reduce subsequent revascularization and non-fatal myocardial infarctions. Of course, there is no impact on mortality. But I know another meta-analysis was presented, Khalid, um, today, again addressing elderly patients. You want to talk to us about that? Yeah, well, that was the Earth STEMI meta-analysis, which looked at complete versus culprit-only revascularizations in an elderly cohort of patients, but this time with STEMI. Uh, the rationale behind this study was based on available randomized data. Complete revascularization is recommended for patients presenting with STEMI and multivessel disease. However, its long-term benefit in older patients, which may have limited life expectancy, is debated. The individual patient data meta-analysis investigated the safety and long-term benefit of complete revascularization in STEMI patients presenting with multivessel disease who are above the age of 75. The primary endpoint was the occurrence of death, MI, or ischemia-driven revascularization. The key secondary endpoint was the occurrence of cardiovascular death, MI. Endpoints were assessed the longest available follow-up and at, at each year. This is the largest study focused on older patients above 75 presenting with ST elevation, MI and multivessel disease, looking at culprit versus complete revascularization. Complete revascularization was associated with a significant reduction in the composite endpoint of death or MI. There was no long-term benefit, obviously, regarding mortality. Now, what clinical implications can we draw from this meta-analysis? Well, this, uh, the, uh, the authors of this study conclude that complete revascularization she should be considered a reliable strategy to reduce ischemic endpoints in the first three years following an acute event in an older patient presenting with STMI and multivessel disease. Yet they do conclude that further data is required to establish the impact at longer follow-up, especially with regards to mortality. So something else that you know we, we always struggle with with um, you know our anesthesia colleagues and the hospital is patients who are requiring cath lab procedure with conscious sedation not necessarily general anesthesia and the whole question of fasting and non-fasting i know it was presented today so can you just talk to us a little bit about that yeah i'm, I'm going to have to change my practice because <laughs> i'm one of the old guard that keep my patients fasting so this uh, this study looked at whether or not we should do that. So uh, it was a randomized trial look in carried out in Australia, the SCOF trial, that looked at fasting or no fasting prior to, car uh, to cardiac catheterization. 716 patients were included who were having a, piece, a, coronary, a coronary angiogram or coronary procedure that required moderate sedation. 
and it was designed to see if no fasting was safe as fast as, as fasting and if removing fasting improved patient satisfaction. The primary outcome, they looked at complications that we usually associated with going to the cath lab in a non-fasting state and administering administra uh, sedation. Aspiration pneumonia, low blood pressure, high blood sugars, low blood sugars. Uh, and they, they, uh, what they found was that the probability, there was a 99.5% probability that no fasting is as good as fasting. They also found a 99.1% probability that no fasting was better than fasting. And it was associated with better uh, patient satisfaction scores uh, with, uh, with no fasting scoring 15 uh, versus uh, no fasting scoring 11. So again, it was, there was no downside to feeding these patients and uh, patients felt better and had the more positive patient experience. So maybe we should stop getting our patients to fast before routine angiography or PCI. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly reassuring data and can help us start our conversations in our respective uh, hospitals. But there's one final study that I do want us to touch on today. Um, it was the extended uh, results of the AVATAR trial. Now this is of course a surgical trial that actually enrolled over 157 low risk patients with severe aortic stenosis. And um, they were a low risk population, meaning their mean uh, STS score was actually 1.7. The mean age was 67 and about 57% of them were men. Um, they did an intention to treat analysis for these patients and they followed them up with a median follow up of 63 months. And those are the results that they ended up reporting today here at uh, uh, ESC. And we know that the primary endpoint was a composite, and it occurred in 23.1% of those who had early surgical aortic valve replacement, and 46.8% in those who were conservative arm, meaning it was just watchful waiting and following up these patients echocardiographically and for symptoms. And it's interesting that they, the Kaplan-Meier uh, estimates for the individual endpoints of all-cause death, heart failure, hospitalizations, were significantly lower in the early surgery. And so, you know, it would be really interesting to see as we await the early TAVR trials, mm -hmm. if they will parallel the results of the early surgical trials. Absolutely. Now, those are coming up towards the end of October at TCT. Well, thank you, everyone.